everywhere. Engaging in. Eternity. This is the truth. It's the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church will last forever and ever. I'm talking about the church. professors of our family university shy away from teaching and training our children about the most important thing that they could ever know and understand what a relationship with God is all about. We can grow, we can share our lives together, we can go out and do the work that God wants us to do. It's not our God who is able, it is our God whom we serve. Jesus said, put a new song in our mouth and praise in our heart and others will see what the Lord has done for us and glorify God. Providence is the working of the details of your life and mine. Providence is knowing that God is orchestrating the details of our days and our lives and our encounters and our opportunities that he's actually ordering our footsteps. God isn't just interested in getting you to do something. He wants you to understand that he sees you just like you are and right where you are and he loves you and his prayer for you is that you let him set you free in these days there are people out there who are going to try and take your hope from you but you got to hold on to it and realize if god spoke a vision and a future into your heart no person can take that away from you you don't allow that to happen you let hope rise in your spirit because that's what Jesus puts inside every one of us. I'm gonna stand up for Jesus, no matter what the cost. Good morning and welcome home to Life Point. My name is Graham and I get to serve here. Our mission as a church is to bring glory to God and love as many people to Jesus as we can before we die, period. If you're new to Life Point, a very special welcome home to you. We're about to have an hour long service, including a message in our series, Fresh Start. If you need anything, we have hosts with yellow name tags at every door. Be sure to follow us on social media, download our mobile app, and check out our website at lifepointlebanon.com. Have a fantastic Sunday. Hey guys, how you doing this morning? My name's Ethan, I get to be one of the pastors here. Um, I got a few announcements just to kick off the thing, uh, because we're gonna get into worship, and we're gonna stay into worship today, is that all right? Awesome. Um, so uh, if you're a first-time guest, we want to invite you back next week. It's so good to see you guys here today. Um, and also, if you're a first-time guest, you can grab a free gift from the VIP table in the back in the foyer. Um, there's sign-ups for the C3 conference um, at the point. If you're interested in that, you can talk to uh, one of the pastors or something like that. Maybe they'll have some information back there for you. I think they do. Um, and also, who likes United Night? We have United Night this Wednesday, January 22nd, uh, right here. We're going to all meet here. Every, every ministry is going to meet here, and we're going to be united. We're going to have baptisms that night. Baptisms are a big deal at our church, so we're going we're gonna to do that. If you want to get baptized for United Night, we want to urge you to talk to one of our pastors after service, and we'll have sign-ups for that as well at the point. So uh, who's ready to worship? Why don't you guys get up, and we'll get started. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. God, I just ask that you be in this place with us. God, help us to focus on you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord there's power
every war he wages he will win And I'm not backing down from any giant I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory What the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Come on! You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you
presence on holy ground. We are standing in His presence on holy ground. struggle that's happening in, in everything that we're doing, God, we are yours. God, no matter what kind of work schedule we have, we are yours. No, no matter if our kids hate us, we are yours. No matter if, if the struggles of, of, of every day are too much for us to handle, we are yours, Jesus.
and have a seat for just a moment. We want to respect what's kind of going on up here with prayer. I just want to say that it is amazing to start our day out with such wonderful worship and to have the freedom to do that. We're going to continue that time of worship. Um, many of you know that this is when we go ahead and take up our tithes and offerings. And today I want to share something with you. Um, some of us have a really hard time letting go of our finances. And I got to tell you, that's the easy part. We have uh, three children in our home, and our oldest uh, did some work for some friends of ours a few summers in a row. And when he came home, I was cooking dinner one day, and he comes in and he says, Mom, Mom, I need some change. I need some change. And I'm like, I'm cooking dinner. What do you need change for? And it was a Saturday, and he says, I need to be able to pay my tithe. And I, this is, he had $200 bills in his hand, which is a lot of money for a teenager. It's a lot of money for me. Um, but he needed $20 because he wanted to make sure he could pay his tithe. And, you know, in that moment when I was cooking dinner, I was annoyed that he was bothering me. But as I think about it later, we've taught him something. He's seeing the faithfulness in our home from us paying our tithes. And no matter how hard it got to continue to pay those tithes. I have story after story I can share with you. But today, that story about our son being faithful was huge. There's a verse, and it's uh, Proverbs 22, 6, direct your child onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. And this past week has been really difficult. And if you know some of our teenage boys here at church, they've struggled with a lot of hurt in their life. So the easy part is paying the tithe. The hard part is when they question why things happen. Why does this happen? But they can remember that tithe was easy and they paid it and God's been faithful. And so as they move on through life, I can only pray that what my husband and I teach our kids is that they'll remember that God's faithful. He's faithful in the hard times. He's faithful in the good times. And believe me, the finances are the easiest to give up. When you're hurting, it's hard. If you can learn from the easy stuff, the harder stuff is a whole lot easier to handle. We're going to go ahead and ask the ushers to come forward and pray over the offering today. Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for teaching us to be obedient in the small things and allowing us to trust you in the big things when they hurt. God, we love you and we trust that you are always going to be there for us, even when we question why. God, I pray that you be with us offering today and you would just bless the hands that have given. And God, those that are questioning, just bless their heart, Lord, and let them know that you're there. We love you, God. We ask that you continue to be with us in service. Amen. Hey, good morning, Life One. How you doing today? Well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad we're awake. <laughs> Guys, I'm so glad to have you here. If you're new, my name is Kelly, and I'm one of the pastors here at Life One. just want to say welcome home. I am so glad you're here today, and, and you picked a great day to be here. We are in a new series called Fresh Start, where we are uh, kind of not only looking at the, the new year that we're heading into, but we're, we're launching into a new decade of ministry. Uh, this is the 10th year of our church, and so we're celebrating what God has done, looking forward to what lies ahead. And we are, we're taking some time to, as we look 
into this 10th year, as we look into what is going to happen in the next 10 years, uh, we want to just kind of reestablish the foundation of our church. We want to we want to set things up and 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 recast the vision for Life Point Church. Last week we started off by just kind of doing a deep dive into our mission statement so that we can have a, a good sense of and a reminder of what God is calling us to as we live these lives and and what's going on. I know some of y'all were iced in last week because it's it's the weather in in Missouri. It was awful, crazy, nasty weather outside, and then it was 62 degrees on Monday. Crazy, crazy stuff that happens. But um, welcome to welcome to Missouri. Uh, but what, we're here for a reason, and we, we talked about that last week. If you missed it, please go get caught up in the archives because I think it's one of the one of those foundational messages that is important for our church. In fact, this whole series is. But let's just state real quick why we're here because I think it's so important that we're reminded. Let's say this together. We are here to glorify God and love as many people to Jesus as we can before we die, period. That's, that's what we're here for. That's what we want to see happen. I believe that God has great things in store for us for 2020, but I also believe that if 2030 is going to be better than 2020, that we're going to have to live this message out, live this mission out on a regular basis because, because I believe that there are great things ahead, that this call that God has given us is tremendous. We want to see more people come to know who Jesus is. We want to see more families uh, that, that are set free. We want to see more marriages that are, that are broken, find healing. We want to see more addicts break the chains of addiction. We want to see more people enjoy the power and the love of God right here, right now in their life today. We want to see what God can do. And to get there, we want to take a fresh start, which is this series. As we look at all of these different things that we're going to be talking about, the fun foundational scriptures that we started as a church, two of those scriptures are going to be part of the service every week because they are such essential scriptures to understanding what it even means to be a Christian. Now, the first one is something I hope you're very familiar with. These are Jesus' last words. Usually when we think about someone's last words, we think about the power and the importance of what those words are. These are Jesus's. And it's at the end of Matthew chapter 28. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority on heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This one passage gives us all kinds of direction as to what we're supposed to do as a church, who we're supposed to be as a church, who we're supposed to reach as a church. It's so important that we understand that. But as we go to accomplish this, we need to understand who we are called to be. And Jesus addressed that in another uh, few verses here in Matthew chapter 22. That there's this time they were trying to trap Jesus, trying to, trying to get Jesus to kind of make a theological and a teaching error. So they, they asked him this question that is maybe kind of akin to the impossible question. What, dear teacher, what Jesus is the most important law of all the commands? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus was saying, What we're called to as Christians, the disciples that we are called to go out and make, this is what they're supposed to look like. This is supposed to be how they're supposed to be. People who love God with everything they have and the love that they have for God is on display in how they love God's children. Those brothers and sisters in Christ that God has placed us in the world next to. So you don't always get to pick your neighbors, you don't get to pick your brothers and sisters, but you do get the opportunity to love them. And you cannot love God without loving people. It's just impossible. And so as we look at these two passages, they are foundational passages. We are absolutely a great commission church. We are absolutely a great command church. Your entire life could be spent trying to figure out how to live these two commandments out in everything that you do. These two statements sum up everything God is calling you to be, God is calling us to do as a church. It's not like we throw the rest of the Bible out, just kind of hold on to these few verses. The rest of the Bible informs everything. It gives the details. It it helps fill in the gaps to provide the directions and distinctions that we need so we can live out the purpose that God has for our life, that God has, let me be specific, for your life. 
I want to be really clear on something because I, I think it's something that's so vital that we understand. You do have a call, a mission to fulfill for God in your life. You may think, no, there's no way I, I don't have the education. There's no way I don't have the, the, the testimony. There, there's no way I don't have the... No, 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 no. I want you to understand if you're living and breathing right now in the room, God has something for you to do in your life. Amen? Amen. God has a work for you. God has a purpose for you. And you will not find the deepest amount of satisfaction and joy that you can have until you're walking and living according to that purpose. You were created for God's glory. Uniquely gifted as you are, so you can love people to Jesus in the way that only you can. So this being the case, I'm, I'm speaking to Christians. If you're here today and you're not a believer, if you're listening and you're not a believer, you can just take a break. Take a break. You know, go get a Mountain Dew, something, I don't know, whatever you do. <laughs> this part's for the Christians. Let me ask you, where is your life pointed? Who does your life point to? Because how you live speaks volumes about what you really believe. The way you live speaks volumes about where your hope truly is. So I want you to know today, you're not here by accident. You're not listening to this message by accident. There is a real and a powerful reason that you're here. And I'm going to tell you, it's because God wants your life to matter. He wants your life to have the deepest significance and as we each pursue that call, as we come together as his church, unified under his mission to pursue that call, we become something that is truly unstoppable. Jesus told Peter that the gates of hell could not stand against the church, which means that we need to be working to knock the gates of hell down for the glory of God. We need to have so much confidence in who he is and what he's called us to that we would storm the gates of hell with water pistols and come out on top. I believe that God is working in us to get there. And that's why we're covering all these scriptures. That's why we're digging into our foundational directions as a church, because not only do we want to embrace these directions as individuals, we need to embrace them as a church so we can do all that God has called us to do, so we can be all that God has called us to be, so we can make the impact that God has called us to make. And I really hope that means something to you, because it means everything to me. At the end of our days, we will all stand before God and we will hear something. Can I tell you what I want to hear? I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I want to make you ruler over, ruler over many. Enter into the joy of our Lord. Can I just tell you something? I don't want to be a killjoy, but not everybody's going to hear that. Scripture tells us that there's going to be many, and they're going to say, God, I was a good person. I did good things. And God's going to say, I, I didn't know you, and you didn't know me. I want to be the kind of person that God says, well done. Enter into the joy of your salvation. So today, I want you to hear this. And if you're not a believer, this is where you get to tune back in. Because God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you and mine. And as a church, we need to understand that. We are in the life change business. And when we live out our mission, this is exactly what we should see happening. And so we want our lives to point people where they need to go. These are our directions. We hope to direct people upward through lifting their hearts in worship, inward through building authentic relationships, outward through serving those in need, downward through being rooted in discipleship, and forward through sharing and embracing the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now we're going to cover each of these in depth, but we're going to start with the one that we have to have in place before we get to all the rest. We're going to start with the one that, that I believe uh, if, if, if we do it right, then the rest of things are going to fall in place. We're going to start with where we orient our heart. Let me pray. God, I believe we're here today at this time for a reason. And God, we need to hear this. God, we need to get this. I need to get this. 
And God, I, I need your power and your strength to flow through me right now because I don't have it. I'm relying on you. Speak to us today, Jesus. Amen. God has called us first and foremost to be worshipers. That's, that's the whole giving God glory part of what he has called us to. Worship is what giving glory to God is all about. It's why we're here. Rick Warren says the church exists to worship God. How do we love God with all our heart? By worshiping him. Worship is such a big aspect of our lives. We direct our hearts upward through lifting our hearts in worship. Worship is a discipline that we do. It's something we make time for. It's something that we, that we, that we choose to engage in. It's something that we desire as believers because worship is this way that we interact with the very Spirit of God. But the fact that we often have to discipline ourselves to do it says something about us and the way we perceive the world around us and the way that we fit into it. See, there's this thing that happens in our development, and particularly in the world that we live in here in the United States of America, and I love our nation. I don't want to bash our country. I don't want to bash Western culture. But the reality is that we've been so affluent. We've been so wealthy for so long. We've been able to, to meet our needs so well without really having to depend on God that, that it creates something within us that disconnects us from the need we have to connect with the Lord. And that's a very real thing. Sometimes we're so blessed. We've been so blessed for so long that we don't realize the world doesn't revolve around us, that we don't always get what we want, and that getting what you want all the time really isn't that good for you anyway. We live in a culture where everything is automatic, where we don't really have to rely on anyone, and, and that, we, that if we do that, that it's seen as a weakness. We're told again and again to look deep inside ourselves to find all the answers. Just believe in yourself and you'll be all right. And we often hear that message even in the church because the message in our culture is so pervasive that it has gotten through the walls of the faith community. But that plan fails every time. Because we are not the center of the universe. We are not all powerful on our own. And if you could find the answers deep inside of yourself, then why did you get in this mess in the first place? Amen. We're in an amazing time. The world has never seen this much prosperity. Poverty is a very real issue in the world, but the world has never been better as far as terms of poverty go. Technology has never been this advanced. We have pushed humanity to new and greater heights than ever before, yet at the same time, with all these blessings, we are on more psychotropic medication than we've ever been on. We're facing an addiction epidemic. We have more suicides than ever before. This is the reality that we face, and at some point in time, we have to start asking the question, what in the world is going on? How can we be so blessed, yet also be so broken? There are all kinds of answers, but I want to point you back to this is, is what Scripture continually, time and time again, points us back to. You were not made for you. You were made for worship. And since Adam and Eve, our greatest temptation has been and will always be to worship ourselves and our wants and our desires over that of the Lord. For our ways to his, our desires over his will, we become the center and then wonder why our worlds fall apart. And here's what I need you to understand. A deficiency in our worship indicates an insufficiency in our understanding of God. And I believe this with everything in my being, that if we just really knew who God is, if we could just grasp a hundredth part of his glory, it would change everything if we could be all transported into the throne room of God for just 10 seconds, just 10 seconds in the very presence of the Lord, it would change the outlook that you have for the rest of your life. Just a, just a blink of time in, in God's presence would, would shift everything. You would never be the same. It would change the way you live. <laughs> When God starts speaking like that in service, you got to watch out. 
<laughs> Francis Chan says this, having a high view of God is the solution to most of your problems. Let me talk about that. Because I agree 100%. I want to focus on that today. There's so many things we could talk about with worship, so many different rabbit trails that we are so happy to go down. <clears throat> but if worship starts anywhere other than with the reality of who God is, it ceases to be authentic worship and transforms into idolatry. We embrace our preferences of what we feel like worship should be rather than giving our hearts and souls completely to him who is worthy of our worship. I refuse to go there. Instead, I want us to see who he is. When we read in Scripture about what happens when people are physically in the presence of God, they never come back the same. It's such a big deal. I think we just need to look at a few of those instances. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel is a prophet. He's at the very beginning of his ministry. He's getting ready to go out. He's going to be the advisor of kings and common people. He's going to be God's voice on this earth. He's preparing to do what God has called him to do. And as a part of that calling, as a part of that preparation, God brings him into the very throne room. And this is what it says. And he gets there, and he's looking around, everything around him. He says this, And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne there was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. And so the throne is lifted up. The throne is lifted up, but the, but the man was even up above it. And, and he is trying to explain. He says, it's a likeness. It's, it's like this. He's, it, basically what he's saying is, I, I have these words to describe what was put before my eyes. But this is the best I can do. The furniture is made out of gemstones. What's made out of wood in my house is made out of the most precious material in his house. What we use to signify royalty, he sits on in heaven. And he's high above all things. Ezekiel's trying to describe what he's seeing with, with, with words that just are not adequate. And he goes on, he says, also from the presence of his ways, he's talking about God and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around and within it. And then from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around it. He said, and as I looked at God, I, I saw him, and it was it, like the, from the waist up, it looked like fire. And from the waist down, it, it looked like a different kind of fire. I don't know how to say this, but he was on fire. And, and that's all I can say, but he wasn't burning up. He wasn't being consumed. He was just, he was on fire. But it's different kinds of fire, and there's a distinction, and I could see. And he's describing this situation. It's, it's more than he's ever thought he could imagine. It's, it's more than, than his limited use of language could ever begin to describe. And he says, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. He said, he said there was something about him that radiated from him. It looked like a rainbow in the rain, but it wasn't raining. I don't know what to call it. I don't know what to say. But it was like all these colors. It was, just, it was this... Wow. Whoa. Have you ever been in a situation where you just didn't have enough words, where all the adjectives failed? You could think. You wanted to communicate, but you just couldn't. You wanted other people to understand so they could understand what you saw, so you could connect, but there was no way. Every time you started to explain the situation, that the story just falls apart. And, and what they could they even believe what I'm trying to tell anyway? And as he's trying to explain this, as he's trying to stand in the presence of God, Taking him in, taking and everything around him, he says, so when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. He was so overwhelmed with the glory and the majesty of God that, that he just fell face down on the ground. 
He's like, ah, this is so big, this is so much beyond me that I've got to, I've got to get low. I've got to find a way just to, just to get down. And I, 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 can't, I can't stand in the presence of one so mighty. I can't stand in the presence of one who is so great. I, I've, got to be, I've got to be face down. He was so overwhelmed that all he could do was position himself as low as he could possibly go because the one who was in front of him was impossibly high. He didn't understand. He couldn't understand. But he knew it was bigger than him, so he did the only thing he could do. Can you imagine? In another similar story, another prophet He was also at the beginning of his ministry. So go to Isaiah chapter 6, and it says some really powerful things and some things that I hope that that will connect with your heart today. And I'm going to really try hard not to go way over time. And it starts like this, Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, we've got to stop for a second because it's so important that we get this. King Uzziah had been a great king. And the people flourished and the people prospered. And then he passed away. And in years past, that always meant things are going to change. That always meant that that things were about to fall apart. That always meant that that bad things could potentially be happening now. What's going to happen? How are we going to handle this? And so here comes this new young prophet to speak God's wisdom to the earth, to point people to hope and Man, the thing that they had put their hope in so much, the the leader of their nation, he had just passed away. And so now what was going to happen? How was this going to be? There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of wonder. There was a lot of worry. And this is the way. This is the way that his ministry starts. I think that heading into election year, we need to spend more time reading the B-I-B-L-E rather than watching Fox News and MSNBC. I think that the whole reason behind the timing of this vision was so that God's voice on the earth, his prophet, his, his man, Isaiah, could see the power behind the throne, the power above the throne, the one that is beyond the kingdom that is bigger than the kingdom, so he would not put his hope in man's kingdom on earth. Isaiah is one of the greatest men of God to ever live. He needed a new perspective, just like we need one today. And listen to what he saw. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And it says, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Catch this, the whole place was shaken like there was an earthquake or something, and it wasn't even God speaking it. This was God's butler. The one who was about to introduce him. The one who says, get ready for what you're about to see. Here he comes. Let me just tell you who he is. He's the holy one. He's not just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah is completely and hopelessly undone in his presence. Verse 5 says, so I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And I think this is funny because Isaiah just starts repenting immediately. And he says, I've I've said some bad stuff. And my list would be way longer. (laughs) He was confronted with his sin and the presence of the holiness of God. And he just immediately starts to repent. He immediately immediately starts just to, to put it all out there and give God glory. God is so thoroughly other, so wildly different, so amazingly more in every way that all Isaiah can do is confess his human inadequacy. 
And what I find beautiful about this is that God doesn't offer to counsel him. He, he doesn't say, yeah, man, you're right. I heard what you said. It was really bad. He doesn't try to convince him of his sin. God simply reveals himself in his glory, in his splendor. And Isaiah's proper resp- response isn't to run away. It is to, again, bow down. It isn't to start asking questions or making demands. He is simply and truthfully and authentically, he just starts to worship God and his life is changed forever. And I believe this because of the stories that I read here and there's other stories. John was in the presence of God. And if we could just get a 10 second peek into the throne room, if we could just experience the power and presence of God in his throne room, it would completely change our perspectives. And, and, and here's the thing. I don't want to be insensitive, especially after my family has gone through the pain and, and deep loss of, of losing someone that was so close to us this week. I don't want to be insensitive. I know how many of you are suffering. We have been praying for you with those prayer cards every day this week. The problems that we face in this world today are real and they are serious. But as significant as they are, if we were transported to the very throne room of God, in that instant, you would not ask him why. And you would not make demands. You would not shake your fist. You would fall face down. You'd be overwhelmed in all the ways that you have fallen short. And you would never, ever, be the same again. See, see, this is why we lift our hearts upward in worship. See, worship is about magnifying God, which honestly sounds kind of strange. How do we make God bigger than he already is? I mean, do you have that power? Do you have that ability? Can you actually make him bigger? No. But authentic worship makes God bigger to you. And we desperately need to see God as he is rather than as we want him to be. When we allow God to be smaller to us than he actually is, we we turn him into our servant rather than living our lives to serve him. Our prayers turn into requests that we throw into a cosmic vending machine rather than, than something that God can use to shape our hearts more like him. We all come to God because of what he does for us. But no mature Christian stays that way. They don't stay with God just to see what they can get. Such an attitude belies the truth that one doesn't know the God that they claim to serve. Worship changes that, and here's why. Authentic worship itself is dangerous. If I worship God authentically, I have to acknowledge that I don't have all the answers. If I worship God authentically, I have to be honest enough about the fact that I am not enough, and I have to do that without victimizing myself. If I worship God authentically, I have to trust that he is all sufficient. And I have to trust him when I don't understand, even when it hurts. On January 2nd in Adamwa, Nigeria, the terrorist group, Boku Haram overwhelmed that, sit, that city-state. They were targeting Christians specifically. They would kidnap them, they would torture them, they would film videos and demand a ransom for the release. They released all of the believers after a few days, with the exception of one. His name is Pastor Lawan Andimi. This is him. They've held Pastor Adimi. And they have tortured him, and they have threatened him, they have threatened his family. And they they have made a mockery of him because of his faithfulness to our Lord. They forced him to make a a video to beg for his life and beg for his release. He made all the demands that he would have to make that they would force him to say. But as he said them, the video itself fell flat. There was something about him, about the way that he carried himself in that predicament, in that situation, that spoke a truth beyond the words that he was forced to say. And he closed his message by saying this, by the grace of God, I will be together with my wife and my children and my colleagues. But if the opportunity has not been granted, may it be the will of God. Be patient. Don't cry. Don't worry. Thank God for everything. He says this knowing that he is likely to meet 
a brutal end at the hands of a Muslim sword. He is a modern-day Shadrach. He's still being captive, even if he's alive right now. We don't know. Yet his faith did not waver. There are many in this situation who have denied their faith to save their lives. He did not. It's not that he was a pastor. His influence for Christ is why they pick him. They knew that if they could break him, they could break the church community as well. He's a worshiper who is trusting God with everything he has, even though he has no promise of rescue at all. The peace and confidence that he displayed in the video has served to bolster the Christian church in Nigeria who is under threat of attack by this group that is being allowed to run rampant and terrorize all those who don't acknowledge their Lord. And as they see him, as they see the power of God working in him in this impossible situation, they are proclaiming the goodness of God more boldly than they have before. See, that is the kind of faith that the world needs to see because that's the only kind of faith that makes sense. We worship in tragedy because those are the times that God is near. Because our worship brings comfort and speeds our healing. Because God is is bigger than all of our problems. He has to be. And if he's not, then he's not God. No, if God is who we say he is, if he's who scripture describes to us in the text, and if we believe that, it changes everything. It changes how we live and how we think and the decisions that we make. See, worship is not an event. It is a lifestyle. The world is dying to see what it looks like when people of faith truly believe. I like what Francis Chan has to say about this. He says, If you really believe God is so great, then how can you be so casual about it? How come you don't live differently than you do? If you really believe in a heaven and a hell, why don't you tell me about it? If you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, then how come your life is worse than mine? How come I am honest and you continue to lie? If you really believe that God is who he says he is and How can you sing about him so casually? How can you give so casually? How can you live so casually if he really is who he says he is and and you really love him the way you say you love him? You see, when love drives all our actions, when love first is our first response, then we are finally worshiping God as he has called us to. Proper worship gives us a perspective, a reverence, and it forces us to consider how everything we do gives God glory. And we need to consider that, especially in the world that we live in today. Because we need to worship. We need to worship Him. God has not called us to be casual disciples. He has called us to be all in. This is what worship is all about. Christians who hide their faith in the public square are like men who hide their wedding ring when their wife is out of town. We can't worship so shallow. We need to consider some things as we worship here in our church, in our homes, on our own. In Ecclesiastes Solomon gives us this warning, kind of this direction as we Think about entering into worship. And, and again, this is, this is more than just, just coming to church. And it's, it's more than just that time that we sing. It's, it's the way we live our lives. He says, says, guard your steps. As you go to the house of God, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. And listen to this. Let's just listen. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to to utter anything before God as God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. 
Sometimes we, we pray to God all the things that we want and all the things that we need. And sometimes we complain to God because things didn't happen the way that we wanted them to. And, 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 and God's big enough to handle that. But, but there comes a time that we just got to stop all those things and, and see God for who he is and understand that he is bigger and beyond anything we've ever conceived, anything we could ever contrive. That God who is above all and is over all <laughs> loves us. So today as we close, I'm going to ask you to do something different. I'm going to ask you to do something that's probably uncomfortable. Some of us are going to need to seriously just repent. And and we can repent where we're standing. We can repent at these altars. I'm going to ask some of you to stand because that's what you would do if you were finding yourself in the presence of God. Some of you need to sit. I'm going to say some of you can stand and turn around and kneel in your pew. Some of you are going going to want to raise your hands. For some of you, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's, that it's time to sing because this is not time for you to sing. This is time for you to reflect. And, and for some of you, I believe God's going to say, lift your voice. We worship differently for a purpose and a reason. But I'm going to ask you as we close to do something you wouldn't normally do to experience God in a way that you never have because we were made to worship. So let's reorient our hearts this morning before we leave. So we can live this life that God has called us to. Let's stand. You are God in heaven, and I am here on earth. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so. sing one more time and maybe standing is exactly what you need to do. God says in his words, I want holy men everywhere to lift their hands on high. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. I'm going to ask some of you, maybe maybe that's not what you need. Maybe you need to do what what some have done already and that is come down here and, and get on your face before the almighty God and allow him to speak his love and joy into your heart. Allow him to bring you the comfort that you've been holding at bay. But right now we're going to worship God. So what is God saying to you? Maybe it's, Kelly, I can't, I can't come down there. I'm in the balcony. Maybe, maybe now is time for you to not worry about what's going on around you. And, and you're going to turn around. You're going to kneel in your pew. And you're going to say, right here, I'm in your throne room, Lord. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to say, God, show yourself to me. Ethan, won't you sing again? What is God calling you to?
Let's let the Lord inhabit the praise of his people. Lift your voices. Let's sing together. Let's worship him. You are perfect in all of your ways. you make your presence known. Father, that your desire is for us to know you, God, to be filled by you. So God, reveal yourself to us in these moments, and God, in, in moments throughout the day, and God, may our hearts and our lives continually point to you, Jesus. And God, may we find strength and hope and direction and joy and fulfillment. And power, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Guys, we're going to have some pastors up here. If you need to pray, if you want to talk to somebody, come on up. Let's talk with you. Grace and peace. Have a great Sunday.